This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Welcome. In this chat, I have Frost from Satyricon as the guest. Now, the catalyst for our conversation was Satyricon's 2018 Australian tour. Despite the quality of the phone line being about as legible as a potato, Frost shares his insights on a plethora of intriguing topics. We discuss his anticipation for the shows and we delve into the band's 2017 album, Deep Calleth Upon Deep, and reflect on the phenomenon of new fans who might not be familiar with the band's extensive back catalogue. So please do bear with us through the less than ideal audio as Frost, the very talented man behind the skins for Satyricon, provides us with plenty of rolled gold throughout this conversation. So here he is, Frost. Hello. Hello, mate. Andy McKay-Smith calling for our chat. How are you going? Hello, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. It's the evening over here, and uh, you will laugh at this being Norwegian, but it must be about 15 degrees, which is actually 15 degrees Celsius, that is, which I don't know what that converts into Fahrenheit, but um, that's about as cold as it gets for us around here. I'm in Queensland, which is subtropical. So I thought I could at least, at least relate that story to you before we kick off and <laughs> find some humour in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh... That's so cool. Um, I remember uh, how it could be in Queensland. <laughs> yes, you played here a few times, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm, actually, we we had a couple of days off um, in Brisbane and at um, first Australia, I think it was after our first tour in Australia, and it was like forty-three degrees Celsius. Yes, that's pretty typical. It's <laughs> in every experience in Norway, even if we have had uh, heat records here over the later years. Yes, that's right. And how have the how have the phone calls with the Australian media going? Because I think I'm the last one for you over the two days that you've been fielding calls from us. And, excuse me, I, I don't hear you that uh, that well right now. Is there you know anything that can be done? Oh, you can't or anything because. Oh, it's hard to hear, is it? Yeah, you're right. I, I'll, what I'll do is I'll hang up and I'll call, I'm calling from Skype, but I use the phone card, so I'll just call back in using Skype, and that should fix it. Oh, but, well, actually, I, I, I hear you talking about this now, so perhaps we can just try it like this for a while and see if it works out. I think it will. Okay, no worries. All right. Well, my question was, how's the how are the phone calls going with the Australian media? Are we are we an interesting lot for you to talk to? <laughs> of course, you are. Yeah, I mean, why why shouldn't we be? We uh, we enjoy playing in Australia. We look forward to going there. We love being there. Uh, and we have lots of fans there, and we have always been very warmly welcomed by by the Australian fans. So so I mean, going to Australia is something that we feel we look forward to. And uh, when I heard that it might not happen, I said that. That's something I would actually really miss quite a lot. I, I really want to go to Australia with Deep Calls if I need to. Uh, that, that's for sure. And I think that's what the other guys in the band as well. Excellent. And look, I've got a, I, had a sp- I had a chat to Sata last year when Deep Calls Upon Deep came out, and I'd only had a chance to listen to it for about two days before I have a ch- had a chat to him. But I really liked it then. But I've got to tell you, I love it now. I actually think it's your best album. And I think it's, you know, we can th- use words like mature and um, well-founded, if you like, given that you've had so many releases. But I really love the direction that you're taking the band in now. So you, I know you're coming down here to Australia and that's the reason for the conversation, but what are your thoughts on the album, Deep Call of Upon Deep? Do you think it's your best album? No doubt. I have been certain about that since before it was released and I feel it no less now than than what I did back then now that we have been performing the songs from the album live for three quarters of a year and 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 those songs have really started to get under our skin now uh, and then I listen to the songs I, I feel the same way and these songs are 
our, our best. Our album is our best. And, uh, and there's, um, there's a vitality uh, and uh, a profoundness in the expression and seriousness and danger to the material on that album that you will find on uh, no previous spirit album. Uh, but really what, what makes the magic for me is, is, is that sense in which the album is alive. It really, it really lives and breathes. I, I felt that way when, when the self-titled album was released. Uh, partly because of the dynamics that we were bringing into the band for the first time with that album. But, um, but, but just that part of it has gotten a totally new dimension of Deep Call for some deep. I mean, that is an album that, that is truly alive and, and musical in the broader sense. So it has opened up something for, for the series and, and which, um, uh, and something that really has of the band go and and I like the direction that we have taken and I think that it has also made our future become even more exciting and interesting. Mm. Yeah, I agree. It wasn't so much a surprise that you guys chose to go in this direction, but the biggest surprise to me was that, look, I'm a father of two young kids and it's one of those albums that I can actually put on around them and they don't complain. Now, take that as a compliment, believe me, because I've got a you know, there's no point in me putting on headphones when I'm looking after two young kids and they're running around the house or of driving somewhere. It's an album that has stayed with me through all sorts of applications. Now, I don't care about genres anymore. I've never been really about that. But to release an album, broadly speaking, underneath the banner of black metal and to have it be as musical and listenable, that's a really, that's a profound accomplishment as far as I'm concerned. So congratulations again. Oh, thanks a lot for that. I mean, what it all comes down to is how the music moves the listener. And you can call it whatever you like. Uh, and, uh, and you could, you know, uh, put it in um, whatever category you like or frame it any way you like. But what the music is actually doing to you is what matters. Where does it take you? Do you sense, do you sense darkness um, uh, and do you sense energy? Do you, do you feel the vibe? Um, and do, you, do you sense, you know, those deeper nuances in the, in the music that will nurture the soul? You know, all of that is really what matters. And to me, deep focus on deep is... is uh, as black metal as it can possibly be, but, uh, but it doesn't matter if you call it that or something else. Yeah. If it needs to be, if it, if it will hit target, you know, uh, but that's matters. Yeah, yeah. Another compliment I'm going to give to you is because I did review the album for the Metal Obsession website, so I'm going to read something out to you. This is one of the paragraphs in it. Here I go. Harold Stad, that's yourself, of course. I'll just use your surname as it, as it is isn't just a great black metal drummer. He would be an excellent session musician for so many metal bands that lack the considered approach of his playing based on his performance on Deep Call of the Pun Deep. His performance on the album is a career highlight and aspiring drummers should pay close attention to his percussive methodology. So I'm going to hand you another applauded, if you like, or another congratulations. I think I've never heard you sound better and I've been following your drumming for a long time because I'm also a musician. I'm I'm a bass guitarist. Now, I don't play heavy metal, but I do pick up when a musician's performance is truly outstanding. And I think the work that you've done with Sartre on this album here, I haven't heard your percussion sound the way it sounds on this album here. So did you did you take an entirely different approach to the drumming on the album? Or tell me about what your methodology was or the approach that you used to drumming on the album. I, I really have to tell it 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 was quite an effort to to make the solutions work. Uh, it was uh, a lot of effort to find the correct expressions for each different song and, and often for each different 
theme of the song, really, um, um, to, you know, get the right kind of musicality and, um, and, and vitality and, you know, all that. And everything is taken quite a bit further on, on this album, as we obviously have noted. I mean, the progressive stuff is more progressive. Um, the intense stuff is perhaps more intense than ever. Um, the groovier stuff is, is, uh, is heavier and groovier and, and more grinding. And uh, making all of that work is, it's incredibly difficult, and Jerry and I spent countless hours making those drums work, and and he was giving me lots of instructions and, and, and input. Sometimes he would more like dictate what kind of drums that the music demanded, because as a composer he would he, he would know that either intuitively or he would you know kind of see his own compositions in his head before they were done. Which you know, the written call arrangements and everything. And, and to make things work right uh, according to his composing ideas, that is, you know, really um, uh, a pivotal point. Uh, and, and the way that he was, you know, going through the hardship, making me find the right solutions. Uh, and that is probably one of the factors there. Uh, and yeah. also that I myself really I mean, invested everything that I had and done so in order to make this work and to and to really grow as a drummer with the project with this and other. So, I mean uh, we have had clear ideas. Peter has been a more brilliant composer here than he has ever been before, and I think that he was already the best in the genre even before this album. Uh, and we have been working tightly together for, you know, as, as long as, and as much as it took. Uh, and, and, and I think that's, that's probably explaining why we have been taking the steps that we have that goes for me and my drumming and goes for everything on this album, I would say. Mm. Have you ever been approached by other musicians to work as a session drummer for them? Is that, is that something that happens a lot to you? Well, that has happened, <laughs> of course. But, uh, I mean, there, there aren't that many drummers in, in this world, um, and especially not in a small country like Norway, and uh, it's um, it's a pretty particular and small and a little incestuous world, this little black little community in Norway. So, I guess in order to make all of those bands, some new business has to be more than one job. But um, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I have been doing some different projects over 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 the years, but for the uh, last. 10, probably even 15 years, hardly anything. And, and, and the later years, I have not at all been interested in doing anything else because I have more to do with my main band here. So, yes. Uh, and I managed to take properly care of, I feel. And, and I'm, I'm doing 349 whenever there's some, some spare time, you know. So, uh, I'm not interested in doing anything else. That's just more learning. Hmm. Okay, fair enough. And I will ask a question now about the tour that you're bringing down. So are a lot of the cuts from Deep Call of the Pun Deep, are they going to be in the set list when you come to Australia? Or because you, you tour here not that often, are you going to bring more of a greatest hits package, so to speak? You know what I mean. I know there's no hits per se, but fan no, favourites, yeah. It's obviously, it's obviously going to be both. Um, whenever we do club shows, we play pretty long shows and we try to Cover our history now also, but but of course it's going to be quite a lot about deep calls upon deep. Uh, it, it, is not a band that is about our past or any past glory. We're about the here and now, and uh, and and we're about current. And uh, we are proud of this album, and, and we think that it should it should put a strong mark on the tour that we're on because it's the reason that we're touring also. 
it's not an excuse to go out and tour playing the old songs over again. Mm, We're yeah. definitely touring with this album. And, um, and we perform several of those, uh, of those new songs on, on every show, and some of them are in rotation. And obviously, basically, perform every night. But we have... We have rehearsed all of the songs from these calls to come these and all of them like really, really well in a live environment. Mm, yeah, yeah, I can imagine they do. Now, do you get, you know, when you get fan interaction, do people keep bringing up the past? And I understand that people do that because, look, I, I got into the band on Nemesis Divina and I still think it's a classic. I just prefer your new album. I think the direction that you're heading is is at my age and 40 years of age, it's a very listenable direction. That's the easiest way I can describe it. But do you get a lot of feedback from fans who just want you to play Dark Medieval Times, The Shadow Throne and tracks tracks from Nemesis to Vina? Well, not a lot, really. Uh, you see what, what happens these days on our shows when we play some of our, our older songs, especially from the... From the three first albums, then we see that you know, more than half the audience seem to not be able to understand what is going on. So they suddenly feel that you know, they have to go buy a beer or have um, a toilet break or, or, or whatnot. And, and some of them seem downright really baffled about what's going on. So we see that you know they don't really follow what's happening on stage. So, so that tells me that Quite a lot of people haven't even heard the old album. Uh, but in a way, it's a, it's a good sign that you know we have people that are, uh, or that we have you know generations of time coming, and and, and that we don't only have you know the old hardcore fans that only want to hear the old songs. I mean, we have to hear them as well, but. Um, but uh, for us, the, the newer stuff, of course, feels more more relevant and it's musically much more rewarding to perform. Um, and, uh, and I mean, even if the metal community in itself is pretty conservative in nature, luckily we don't see too much of it. Uh, and to the extent that it's there, it's just something that. You have to expect, you know, you, you always know it's going to be like that. And I guess it's been like that in other genres. But those people that have um, been growing up with certain albums and that follow the band to a long career, they will still be very, very attached to you know, what they listen to first. And they want to relive that experience they had when they were younger and all that. And, and it's understandable. Uh, so, so we relate to that without, you know, really getting too annoyed by it or, or too pissed off. We, we just know it's going to be like that. Um, yeah. We think that, well, you can think whatever you like. We we will perform some old songs as well, you know, but some ever expect to do the band that is all about the old songs because we can go to other bands and, and get that. We are not about that. Yeah, gotcha. And did did you find that there was a change in audience when you released Now Diabolical? Because I, I like that album a lot as well. I found that, I, I don't know how else I can describe it, but it had a really deep rock and roll groove on that one there, particularly through a track like King, and I love the video for that track, by the way. But did you notice a change in your audience yeah. after that album was released? Yeah, I, I think that we're starting to notice some kind of difference even with Volcano. Uh, um, yeah, more more rock people basically were were showing up when we were playing live, uh, and and also some people that were seemingly just open-minded uh, people, but being deeply deep into music in general, and you know, felt that there was a particular energy and a kick-ass attitude and a great on music that uh, uh, that they liked a lot. Uh, and I think now Diabolical brought, brought even more of that and, and, and that's fine because I think there, there is some kind of a um, kick-ass rock and roll attitude and controversy that years and has been, been doing since, since then that, that is something we like about ourselves and, um, uh, and that's also how the original black voice you know 
Brendan and, and Bakhti was, was, was really much more dirty rock and roll music than, than a lot of Kevin Bakhti with them. Uh, I, I, I know the style that we, that we like a lot and we think that, uh, that, uh, that it's a very good foundation for, for Bakhti's music to, to have more of that uh, that um, that kick-ass and, and dirty rock and roll element. Okay. Well, mate, thank you very much for your time. I'll leave it there. I will definitely be in the audience when you tour. So I just want to offer you a congratulations again. Are you almost? I like to offer a congratulations on a career, definitely. But in my view, you are the you are the preeminent, the very best black metal drummer that's ever been. So it's a pleasure to finally talk to you. And as I say, congratulations on your career and also on your outstanding performance as a drummer. Okay, I'll have to. Thank you, Shane, and uh, I'm very happy to hear all of those uh, kind of My well, pleasure. I strongly look forward to, to come to Australia again in September. So to you, Dan, and be all well in the meantime. Absolutely, mate. No worries. Thank you very much for the chat. Yeah, bye-bye. No bye. worries. Catch you. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I enjoyed participating in it. So if you liked that one, there are many more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening, maybe you like reading, because I've written a book about the podcast. Click on the link in the banner on the website. You'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice, and you can download a sample. And if you do complete the purchase, I want to thank you personally. So please do hit me up. I've got some more information to share with you about the book in the moment, but before we get to that, I need to bid you a fond farewell. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Until next time, it is a very good bye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew Mackay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded and, and he was into having his, his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for, for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I 
I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>